Within the Spread. I'm Captain Chad Bryson and today we're going to bring you another fly tying video. I've had a great response with all the videos that we've done so far and um, everybody keeps asking for more and want to know, wants to know a little bit more of you know what, what I'm using, how I'm catching big fish and all of those things and so what I'm going to show you today, it's a different fly that, that I've been using aside from the double deceivers and the tiger minnow and all of that stuff. This is the flaming chicken and uh, this is basically a marabou fly with a little bit of rabbit strip in the back and again I mean there's like a, a pattern here with a lot of my flies that they're not too complicated um, and that's kind of the idea is that you can you can make a nice fly that's got a lot of action you can see how much action this guy has but you can make a nice fly that's got a lot of action without using too many complicated materials but there are some things in regards to the articulation and how you get the marabou to stand up and maintain a, a little bit bigger profile than, than you know just tying it around the hook shank. So we're going to show you that today, and I hope you enjoy the video. We'll get started. I'm going to go over the tools that we're going to use. There, there's really not too many. It's pretty simple. Um, most important is going to be a good ceramic tip bobbin with gel spun thread. And then I always have another bobbin ready to go that has the flat wax nylon on it. Again, the ceramic tip. A um, little bit of Zappa Gap glue. And a good pair of scissors. And that's really all you need. I'm going to add one more point. Uh, get a lot of get a lot of emails about, you know, what's my favorite vice? Why do I like the one that I use? I use the Dyna King Barracuda. It's a great vise, and if you're going to sit down and do a lot of production tying or, or making big flies, it's really important. It's got some key features. Um, the rotary part is is probably one of the most important because you can not only can you spin the fly around and look at it, you can actually use the rotary portion to you know attach some of the materials. But that's important. I like the little spring to hold the materials back out of the way. It's really critical for, for the articulated flies. But uh, there's a lot of good vices out there. Renzetti, Renzetti and Donaking are probably the best. Uh, you don't have to pay a lot of money for a vice, but I do think that the rotary feature is very important. So we'll get started. Okay, so first we're gonna start obviously with a hook. Um, for this particular fly, for the for the flaming chicken, I've got some Gamakatsu one off trailer hooks, and you know I mentioned before in in my many of my other videos, that, you know the hook selection size is pretty important, and it's it's all about the gap between the point of the hook and the shank of the hook, and so what you want is there to be enough of a gap here so that after you get the materials wrapped on and the fish bites, there's enough distance so that it can actually hook the fish. So since we're using marabou, and marabou tends to compress a little bit more than the deer hair and, and some of the other things, and we're only going to need a one alt hook for this. And This just happens to be what I had. I had some one alt trailer hooks like you would put on a spinnerbait if you were bass fishing. If you've got a, any kind of a one alt J hook, um, even in just the round bend worm hook from Gamakatsu like I use on the double deceiver. If you found those in a one off, that that'd be great. Uh, so anyway, we're going to start with that. I'm using gel spun thread. GSP. It's good stuff. Doesn't build up too quickly, but it holds everything really tight. So I'm going to just lay a little bit of thread there at the back. Trim it off. So with the tail on this fly, you know, I wanted something. I wanted something that gave a lot of action. Marabou gives a lot of action, and so does rabbit. And so I chose the rabbit strip tail. Uh, and this is a barred rabbit. You can buy them in whole skins. You can buy them in whole skins like this, or you can just buy regular zonker strips. I tie a lot of flies and I make a lot of stuff, so I always try and buy the skins and. You can get those at any any of your local privately owned fly shops. I buy most all of my materials from the Fish Hawk in Atlanta, Georgia. And if they don't have it in stock, they can certainly order it. And it's always good to go into your 
privately owned independent fly shops, you always tend to get the best information and best local knowledge from those places. So to select the tail length, I want about a three inch tail and notice I'm tying this with the hair facing down. And the reason I'm doing that is because you know most most everybody, you know, the easiest way to tie it, of course, is to do it like this with the with the hair side going up. How many times have you seen a fish come up and look down at a fly to decide they want to eat it? It doesn't happen very often. Invariably the fish always comes up from the bottom because their eyes are situated on the top of their head, especially predator fish, and it's an easy ambush point. So you always want the hair on this on this fly, the tail, the hair on the tail facing down. So I just kind of wet my fingers here, pull this apart. I'm going to lay it right down onto the hook shank. I know my hands are getting in the way some. I'm trying to keep them out of the way so you can see what's going on. I'm going to pull two tight wraps. Trim it and you can see what happened there. My tight wraps didn't hold. So if you wanted to trim it before you laid it down to make it easier on yourself, that's fine. There's, there's no law against it. Nobody's going to come and visit your house and treat you like a bad person for doing so. But you just want to snug this down really tight. Hold it in. If, you, if it made you feel better, you could even put a little Zappa Gap on there to hold it in place. Using the gel spun thread, I've never really felt a need to. So, I'm just going to wrap it up. Make it nice and smooth. If you wanted to trim this, you could. It really doesn't matter one way or another. So now we're ready to start with the marabou. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to palmer the marabou. And most of the time, when you palmer marabou into a fly, you're using extra select marabou, which is this. It's extra select, it's long stems and you know it's got long plumes coming off of the stems and it does make it easier to work with but how many times have you sat down to tie something you get an idea in your head you want to tie this fly and you sit down to tie it and you say man I don't really have the materials so that happened to me on this fly when the idea first came around I said I was I had the idea in my head and I thought man I, I think I've got everything I need to, to tie this fly with and so I came down into the basement, into the back cave here, and started trying to tie it, only to find out that I didn't have extra select marabou and everything. You know, these, this is this is what we call blood strung. These are the shorter plumes of it, and so I just kind of made it work. And I felt like it was important to share this because you know, so many times you watch a video somewhere of a guy tying a fly, and it's just it's perfect. Everything is perfect, and it's perfectly staged where he has all of the perfect materials laid out in exactly the right lengths, pre-cut, everything. And I can tell you that in my whole lifetime of tying flies, that has happened to me exactly zero times. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to select some of the better plumes out of this blood strung material so that you can at least get your idea you know, formed into something and go fish it and see how it works. And then later on, go back and order the extra select or whatever so uh, that's how we're going to go with it today so first thing I'm going to do because I've got an orange tail and this fly the colors in this fly are all about transition and and how the colors lay over top of each other so that you can kind of have that that really special brown trout appearance in the water so I'm just going to go through this blood strung here and look for something there we go that one's that's a good one right there so what I'm looking for Looking for one that's got the long plumes, just like so. All right. So I'm just going to gently kind of straighten these out. I'm going to pinch a little bit at the top here. Again, I know my hands are going to get in the way. There's not much I can do about it. I'm trying to keep them free, so you can see what I'm doing. So I'm snugging this up on the stem of the marabou. 
trim that just because my OCD forces me to. So now we're going to start the palmering process. And basically what that is, is wrapping just like you would wrap a hackle for a dry fly or something, you know, around a, a really tiny dry fly. But we're, we're going to palmer this. And so I'm going to pull this. Well, first I'm going to get this out of the way. And so I'm going to pull the fibers back straight like so. I'm going to wrap it around. And then as I come around, you got to you got to continually babysit this some to make sure that all the fibers lay out correctly. Because if you don't, they're just going to wrap up on top of themselves and you won't have all of the flowing plumes that you really want, which is what gives it the action. I'm just going to keep wrapping this again and again until basically I get up here to the point that I just kind of can't hang on to it anymore. I'm getting pretty close. So once I get to that point, yep, just like that. So I'm there. So now I'm just, I know my hand's in the way again, but I'm just trying to hold it all together. So I'm going to try and come back up here and grab this with the thread. Like so. Now she's held in. Before I cinch this all the way down and trim it, I'm just going to kind of pull on these fibers of this marabou to get it out there. Make sure it's straight. One of the advantages, I use the Dyna King Barracuda vise, and one of the great advantages of the rotary vise is that now I can spin this around, have a look at my material, make sure it's laying right and looking right. Finish it off, trim it. Okay. So now I've created a little bit of a transition color between the orange and the yellow. So, you know, if we if we kept going, just continually laying marabou down on the shank, it's it's just going to lay down over top of the tail and itself just like so. Which is fine if you're tying standard woolly buggers or or anything else, but you know, we want something that has a little bit of a profile. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to put something in there to to give it that profile. I'm going to build it up a little bit. And we use this technique a lot with steelhead flies when we're laying marabou down over top of a shank or a hook or anything and you know a, a lot of the the purists will use what we call a dubbing ball and it's it's kind of complicated it involves a lot of other tools. It's very effective but you know, my philosophy and the essence of keeping it simple and keeping it, you know, as 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 quick, you know, making it go as quickly as you can. I started using I started using like cactus chenille or estaz from Mets, and basically you you achieve basically the same result as the dubbing ball, which builds something up to hold the fibers of the material out. You achieve that, but it goes a lot quicker. And, you know, I mean, if you want to count nickels and dimes on how much it, it costs you, then fine. I don't really have time for that because I like to tie good flies as quickly and as simply as possible. So I'm just going to lay this in here, tie it down. Now, again, this is one of the parts where the, the rotary vise actually comes in handy. Because all I'm going to do is make this big dubbing ball. But only I'm going to use a staz or cactus chenille. It also gives a little bit of sparkle underneath your fly. Alright, so I've done that. That didn't work out so well at all. thread wrapped around with it. That's one of the things you got to watch with the gel spun. 
is that your thread will grip so well that it will actually wrap itself backwards around the hook shank. So there's my dubbing ball made with a staz. Trim it, leave it close by because I'm going to need it again. All right, so now we've got this. We're all set. So now I'm going to take some of the extra select orange because, again, that's what I had. And if I had my way, I'd be making the whole thing with extra select marabou. So we're going to take this one. And you can see this is going to go a little bit easier. It's actually going to be a little bit easier for me to work with. So I'm going to pinch a little bit at the top here. Lay it, tie it in. Trim it. See, I'm pulling these fibers back. That's going to make it a little bit easier to palmer. See how those wanted to lay down over top of themselves, and that'll make the fly. It'll kill the action on the whole fly. And so I'm going to wrap this right to the point that the stem on the marabou gets kind of big. And that's, that's about where I'm at. It's right there. So I'm just going to wrap it up. Hold it tight while I cut it. Now, lick my fingers, get them a little wet, moisten them up, pull the fibers back, cinch it down. All right, now again, I'm going to rotate this around and look at it and make sure that my marabou is even all the way around. And if I don't like how it looks, you know, this is one of the great things about working with marabou is if, if you know, like I'm looking at this and I'm not really liking how the whole thing looks. I don't think there's enough there. So, but the dubbing ball is good. And it's given me it's given me the profile that I want, but I really would like a little more orange there. So it's a pretty simple deal. You pick another feather like this one and you tie it in. Some marabou is going to be some of your select feathers and even the bloodstrung, some are going to be more dense than others. So, you know, it's going to vary from from selection to selection you know so in this case I'm gonna to have to tie in two if it had been a more dense feather I might not have had to have tied in two so we're gonna tie in another one I'm gonna do the same thing all over again now, when it comes down to tying in the second feather, not only do you have to pull the barbs, the barbels back on the on the first on the feather you're currently tying in, you need to pull them back on the second one too, and just make sure all of it's out of the way, laying in there correctly. And I'll wrap this one until I like the way it looks and you can continually check it as you're wrapping to make that decision on what looks right. You know, and a lot of people say, well, I need to know exactly how many wraps and, and the answer to that question is, I don't know how many wraps it takes because all feathers are not created equal. Some of them are more dense than others. Some of them are more sparse, and so it's going to take a different amount of wraps every time. So this one looks about right. Everything I do here is basically gone on feel and looks. So I got her all wrapped in there. And that looks really, really good. All right, so I like how this is going. So at this point, you've got choices. You can either put in some more blood strung or some a different color of yellow 
on the back of the fly, you know, I like this one was a little the 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 uh, the marabou was a little more dense, and so I didn't have to wrap so many. But on this one, it's not quite as dense. I like the way the orange looks. The yellow is a little sparse. So I'm going to lay one more Estaz ball in here. Um, Estaz dubbing ball in here. I'm going to lay one more in there, and then I'm going to wrap another yellow around the front of it just to give it a little more transition. So here we go again. not going to use the rotary tool this time because now wrapping completely in front of this this marabou while it's standing up you really kind of need to hand wrap it so that the so that the fibers don't get wrapped up in your dubbing ball Should be enough. Trim it. Finish it out. Okay. So now we're going to go back and select some more of the yellow in the blood strung or in other cases it would be yellow in the extra select and you say well okay if, if, you know why not just select two feathers to, to tie at the same time you know if you think it's going to be sparse why wouldn't you just select two feathers at the same time and that's a great question it's something I've done over the years it does work it's just a little bit bigger of a commitment on your part as the tire the fly tire if you want to babysit it I find it easiest to, to be able to customize the fly and get exactly what I want out of it if I time one feather at a time. Yeah, okay, fine. It takes more time, um, but I think the end result is a little bit better. So I found a good one here in the yellow. I'm going to tie it in, trim it. And start palmering. see these shorter stems are a little more difficult to work with if you're just patient kind of babysit it the end result will be good So I'm up here at the top of it. I'm going to try and pull some fibers out. That junk out of the way. Cinch it. Now, if you've got a nice clean finish, this is one of the advantages to the blood strung. If you got a nice clean finish out on your on your tag end here, or your trim end, you can leave it and fold it back and tie it. It doesn't happen often that you get that nice clean finish on it, so it's best just to clip the stem. I know somebody's going to say that, oh, well, you know, you could have left that in there and folded it back, and, and that's absolutely correct. I could have, but I chose not to. That didn't look right. So we're going to finish this out. This is going to be the rear hook. Finish it out. Just like so. So now you can see I'm going to spin around. Look at it, make sure it's even. Yes, it is even. So, this is what we've got. This is going to be a rear hook. Finish it. This is kind of tricky too. I like using my fingers to finish on, on the marabou flies a lot because that way you can keep the, the marabou fibers out of the glue and out of your line, out of your thread. So it's done. We'll trim that one. 
just gonna let it sit. So while we're kind of letting that super glue dry out, we'll talk about the attachment of you know the articulated attachment to the front hook. And you know, in in the past I've used a number of different things. You you've seen me use the the Berkeley big game in 30 pound. You've seen me use different things, probably like wire, and, I'm, and, and you know, and a lot of people have their own little thing that they, they really like to make it work. I've got a variety of stuff that I use today for it. I'm going to use this is this is some really inexpensive fishing line that, believe it or not, I found it at Walmart. It's 50 pound test Zebco Omniflex. This is something that I would never ever use for the purposes of trout fishing anywhere that I would go. But what this line does is it's really good and stiff. It's, it's really good and stiff. And so when you make your articulation out of that, it holds everything out. It holds the rear hook away from the body so that it's almost, in, almost impossible for the hook to swing around and, and you know the rear hook to swing around and hook on itself. Holds it out there nice and rigid and that's what we want. So. This is probably dried enough, so we're going to take this out, set it to the side, get us another hook, and then we're going to start working on that. Always check it, make sure you got it in there tight. There's nothing worse than starting to tie a fly and you get out there near the end and really crank down on it trying to cinch it down with the thread and pops free of the vise or pops loose. Alright so now we're going to cut a piece of the 50 pound. You don't need a lot. I always cut more than I need just because you know it's easier to deal with. If you've got too much you can always trim it off. So I'm going to lay this in, get my hands out of the way so you guys can see. But I'm going to lay this in so that the, the, the end of the line is basically just a little bit back from the eye of the hook. You know, what's that, probably an eighth of an inch or so. And I'm going to make a soft wrap, and then another one, get it kind of positioned how I want, because you want the hook to ride, the rear hook to ride straight up, so you kind of got to pre-plan this a little. Now I'm going to cinch it down a little bit as I go. This does a couple of things. This makes it so that the line lays down to the side of the shaft. and That's exactly what we want. We want it to lay right there on the side. Kind of again, you got to help it along through there. Uh -oh. And this always, this is always a great thing that happens. When you grip your bobbin so hard that the thread comes out of it, everybody loves that. We don't do any editing here at In the Spread, you know, and I mean, unless I just really drop out some sailor mouth stuff, we edit that out. But, you know, when things, things go bad when you're tying, when you're tying, when you're fishing, when you're doing anything, things go wrong. And... You know, to pretend that it doesn't to everyone is really just inaccurate. And so we try and be as realistic as we can. So I've snugged this down all the way to the front. You see my, my rotary is a little loose. So I've snugged it down. And, the, you know, the important thing when you're using it, the great, or one of the great things about using this monofilament is that if you're cranking down on it with this gel spun thread, I'm pulling that about as hard as I can, and the thread, the the line won't, the the monofilament won't slip out of it. You can see I'm actually opening up the hook and pulling it so hard. So there's no way a fish can pull this apart. The monofilament compresses and almost molds against the shank of the hook. So if you do it right, it's never going to come unbuttoned on you. So To help hold it away from the body, you can see here I've got a couple of beads and it holds the rear hook away from the front hook. So I'm using the Sea Striker 8 mil 20 pack. They're super expensive as you can see. 
also available at the Fish Hawk or any good fly shop anywhere. So I'm going to take a couple of these. Notice that the diameter of the insert hole is, is pretty big as compared to, you know, a lot of people want to try and use like trout beads or something like that. And you just don't get the same result because you have to be able to feed this 50 pound line back through itself twice. So I'm just going to thread one on and two on, like so. Now I'm going to take my rear hook. I'm going to thread that. Just like so, it's hanging out there. And so now I want I want this line to come right back through those two beads. And now here again is an important part. So it, depending on how I lay this thread in, if I if or how I lay in the mono, if I lay it in like that, then my hook's gonna ride sideways. And I'm not saying that it's that it wouldn't catch a fish necessarily, but I'm saying that that is not ideal. That is not what we want. What we want is for this hook to ride like that, straight up, up and down, just like the front hook. And so what I may have to do and what you may have to do, you know, it's all about adjustment here between the beads. You know, this is a, <laughs> as my daughter puts it, it's a finely tuned machine. So. Uh, you may have to wrap this this mono around like so in order to in order to obtain exactly what you want. You may have to slide the beads a little bit. So this is kind of a custom adjustment to get this articulation right. And 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 here's the truth. The truth is is that sometimes you're going to get it right, and sometimes it's not going to be right. And you just have to continually work it as it comes around in order to get what you want. So I want it about right there is how I want this. Give myself just a little bit more. The tighter you pull on the top of the monofilament, the more it's going to pull the hook eye up to the beads. And now I can do that and tie it, and it but if I tied it off there, I wouldn't have all of this and this wiggle with the tail and the rear hook is exactly what you want that's what you're trying to achieve so you want just enough left out there there we go that's it so that's what I want right there you want just enough so that it holds that hook away from the body now you may have to hold it in place here while you tie and cinch it all down. I'm really cranking on it. You see I got my finger here on the tip of the bobbin. Pulling it apart again. And again, so I've gotten out to the end. Everything looks good. Let me go ahead and trim this even. Crank it down. Bring the bobbin all the way back here to the back. Okay, now, this is another critical part. If you wrap with the bobbin too far back next to the beads, it pinches them down, pushes it back, it makes your fly ride wrong. So you want just a little bit back here. You want a little bit of the mono exposed. Not too much, just enough. This is where your final tweaking comes in. And that's it right there. So now we're done. So now if I took this, if I whip finish this and took it out of the vise, you would see that there's plenty, plenty of articulated action there. I'm kind of laid over a little bit. It'll twist around. So 
So imagine, you know, what we're what we're fit, what we're targeting with this fly. We're targeting trophy brown trout, the big ones, you know. And those guys, like I've stated many times before, they don't care about bug hatches. That's a waste of time for them. They want meat. They want other fish. That's what they're going to eat. And so when we're, when you're creating these flies, you want to you want to think about the you know the body shape, the diameter. What's a what is a, a baby brown trout going to look like in the river when it's swimming? And so you know I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and lay in another Estaz ball here and make a pretty big one because this this is going to hold up most of the material that you're going to put in front of it wrapped it in and you could use the rotary part of your vise if you wanted what I do with the spring here to help keep my fly out of the way is I just kind of let the spring roll in on a little bit of the little bit of the rabbit fiber and it holds it all back and straight out of the way for a minute so I'm just gonna hand wrap it make a nice big estaz ball You can make this as big as you want or as small as you want. If you you know if you're wanting to make a lower profile fly, don't use as many wraps. If you're trying to make a larger profile like I'm doing here on this section of the body, make a big one. It's one of the great things with all of my flies. I personally think is that there's a number of different ways that you can put a twist on it to make it a little different customize it how you want it to be you know I'm tying flies to to target huge fish in the Chattahoochee River and not to say that this same fly wouldn't work on the White River in Arkansas or any brown trout river that you fish on anywhere because truth is, is it probably would and I would be highly surprised if it didn't however you know, our fish don't like a lot of flash. Your fish may like flash. And if you wanted to palmer in something, uh, you know, some polar chenille or anything that, that you liked, you should certainly do it. Just because I'm doing it this way doesn't mean that there's not a way that you can customize it and make it work better for yourself. So, pick another. Lay down some yellow. Pick a good one. Maybe I can pick a good one. That's a good one. Pull it apart. Tie it in. Sometimes you can just break it out of there really quick thread out of the way. Start palmering, holding the fibers back. There we go. I was about to wrap it on top of itself there. Nobody's going to like that. See what's happened there. Got it wrapped on top of itself. So we come back. Ouch, shark hook. This one's trying to be complicated, so, so I'm going to hold it back, wrap it down. Get off of there. Let my fish. 
fingers, pull back the fibers, crank on it. And I can tell you I've already, before I even finished with that wrap and cinch, I, was, I had already decided I'm going to put another feather in there because I can see spots, I can see open spots, which isn't necessarily horrible, but I don't like the way that everything didn't wrap around completely and wholly covering everything. So I'm going to pick another yellow one, put it in there. And this is one of the pitfalls of not having exactly what you want every single time, but you know, I know how important it is, and all of us know how important it is, that when you get an idea about something, you got to go and do it right then while the idea is fresh. So, got another one. Going to lay it in. Move that one instead of trimming it. Palmer it in, keep everything back. There we go, this one's looking good. That one turned out nice. Just straighten it out some. Cinch it. All right. Beautiful. So now we're going to be ready for one more orange. Before we go to brown. So this one looks good. Everybody wonders, you know, what's what's the deal with the orange? You know, brown trout or brown and yellow. What the orange does is it does a couple of things. It you know the orange kind of stands out in the water. You know, I'm not using a lot of orange, just enough, uh, but the orange stands out in the water just just barely enough to give it that little bit of little bit of color, you know, that you might want in some off off colored water conditions. And if you use just the right amount of orange, it just kind of lays in there almost as an undertone. You know, it's not too overpowering. It just gives it a little bit of a transition. You know, that's really all you're looking for. All right, I think this is going to do. Pull my fibers back. Snug it down. Turn it, have a look. Yep, that's exactly what I wanted. So now we're ready to go with brown. And then again, I didn't have any brown in the extra select. So these bloodstrung ones seem to be seem to have what I needed in them when I was originally making this fly. May have to tie in two. That's okay. Notice on this front hook, I've only used the one big dubbing ball, and there's a reason for that. I'll, I'll get to it in a minute, but right now I just really want to find a good feather. There we go. So I'm 
pull the fibers back kind of get it straightened out there start palmering again So when it comes when you, you know we're getting here near to the end where it's going to come time to put the the fish skull mask on, I like using those. I know all of you say, "Oh man, that's all you use. That's all your flies have got." Well, here's the thing: it creates a great profile for the head of the fly, and they're easy to use, easy to work with, and basically it just gets the job done. So uh, that's why I like them. If you don't like those you could certainly create the head you know if you wanted to spin some wool or you know, deer hair or any of that stuff it would work just the same um, and, you know my goal is the effort of creating good flies as quickly and as efficiently as possible so because I guide 250 days a year I don't really have a lot of time and so when I have time you know, tying flies is part of the job, but when I have time to do other things, I kind of like doing other things. So, all right, I'm going to cinch that. Trim it. And I'm going to take a look. This is questionable of whether or not I need to, whether or not I'm going to put another brown one in there. And if, you know, it just really depends on what your preference is. If you want a darker brown, you know, more more brown on the head, certainly by all means put another, tie another one in there. It's no problem. It's not going to hurt anything at all. So that one is kind of sparse on the brown. We could probably do one more brown feather there. So anytime that you have questions, you can always email in the spread. Somebody's always available to answer questions. You know, I'm in Alaska for several months out of the year, so at times I'm I'm not able to respond to emails immediately or as quickly as I would like to. I try and respond to all of them. Um, but any of the guys that in the spread, if you just email in the spread, they'll be able to direct you in the right way. So we got a little bit of a wrap here. Get them all straightened out. That should be enough brown. Right, I'm going to finish that out. I'm going to cinch it back. I'm going to start kind of working my thread back just a little bit. Keep my hands out of the way so you guys can see. All right, so I'm working my thread back just a little bit over top of that marabou, and all that does is it kind of like it, it snugs it up against the shaft. You can see how much we've built here with all the materials between the the, the monofilament, you know, the marabou fibers, the dubbing ball, and everything. 
So now, you know, it's come, it's, it's come time to do the fish mask. And so you got a couple of choices. On this fly, I just chose to leave underneath the fish mask natural, whatever these natural fibers were, and that's fine, and it works. Clearly it works. Um, if you wanted, you could build another dubbing ball so that it was whatever color underneath the mask that you want. Use that, use that Estaz dubbing ball or cactus chenille or whatever you want. So if you wanted the fish to have an orange head, if you wanted to have a black head, a brown head, purple head, pink head, it doesn't matter. But you could do that underneath. So I'm going to do that now just so you can kind of have a little bit of a visual of, of what that looks like. And I'm going to, I'm still going to go with the orange because the water's been stained here some. So I'm feeling like that little bit of extra color might make a difference. And you know what? It may not make any difference at all, but if it makes me feel better and it makes you feel better as a fisherman, then that's what you need to do. Um, you know, we have a tendency as fishermen sometimes to, to overthink a whole lot of what we do. And one of my best friends in the whole world, Russell Owen, has this saying that I've adapted and have found to be very true, and it's that you just need to do what feels natural. And so if it feels natural to you to put a dubbing ball on here and put your fish mask skull over top of it, then you should do that. And if it doesn't, then you shouldn't. But we're going to do it for this time, so now I'm going to finish it out. I've got just barely enough thread left here. Maybe I can get it done. Ran out of thread. Well, that worked out perfectly. Trim that. I'm going to go ahead now and just touch it with a little bit of glue. Okay, so time for the fish mask. I always kind of like to pre-fit everything. So right there is where it's going to slide up to, which looks about right. And you can see you got that little bit of flash, a little bit of color in there. Glue, a little zap a gap. Now, all I'm doing is holding that in just for, you know, if I can do it without gluing myself to it. So now, and to finish off the head and clean it up, make it look really nice before I glue the eyes on, I'm going to trim it just a little. And then I'm going to take the flat wax nylon thread. And I'm just going to build up some thread in front of the in front of the mask, and that just helps hold it on. Hold it on gives it a little bit nicer, cleaner finish. Nice and snug. All right, so I'm just going to spin it a little bit, make sure my coverage is even like I want it. 
glue. Invariably, it's going to happen. You're going to get some marabou. You're going to get some glue on your marabou. It's no big deal. It's not the end of the world. It'll fix itself. Um, eventually, enough enough time in the water, and the the glue will wash right out of the marabou. But this one's looking about right. Might might have gotten a little sparse there. So we're going to put the eyeballs on. And that's it. So there it is, the flaming chicken. And it's pretty, it's not too complicated to fly to tie. You know, it's there's a lot of steps in it. There's a lot of important things. But, you know, you can see sometimes they, you can you can adjust this to however you want. The, the first one here was a little bit darker on the front. I chose to go a little more sparse, a little more brighter colors. You can change this around to whatever color combination you want. You know, there's a, there's a, a, you know, fire tiger always works really good. A perch color. Always look at you know whatever the primary food source or, or bait would be in your area, and you know you get the you get the articulation with the rabbit tail and all that, and it works really good. So, that's it. I hope you enjoyed it. If you got any questions, just let us know.